Hello, I'm Arlene Herson, and tonight I invite you to meet a woman who successfully combines beauty and brains, an award-winning actress, author, mother, wife, and businesswoman, a woman successful in everything she does. She has written three books sharing her knowledge and expertise in fashion, charm, and self-improvement. She is a motion picture and television star in addition to running her own business, designing shoes and jewelry. In one of her roles, she portrayed the first woman president of the United States. In real life, she is president of her own company. She is a woman who is not just a success, she is an inspiration. She is Polly Bergen. We're here in her apartment in New York. We'll meet her right after these messages, so please stay right there. Hello, I'm Arlene Hurston, and we're here with Polly Bergen in her apartment in New York. Thank you, by the way, for having us in your lovely apartment. Hey, it's a pleasure. <laughs> you know, being here in your apartment, surrounded by all the beauty here, we know you as an authority on beauty and charm. Yet, in learning about you and doing research, I read that as a child you considered yourself a lump. Now, I can't Oh, no, that. I was a lump, actually. <laughs> it was, was not a matter of considering I was a lump. I think really what happened for me, basically, was the fact that I was very, very large at a very early age. I was my full height when I was 11 years old, and I weighed about 145 pounds, which was a lot of weight. And um, at that age, I was very well developed, which was a very embarrassing situation for me. I think that uh, if I had wanted that kind of body at 25, I might have had a shot at doing a few extra things that I didn't get to do, but I had it very early and too much of it. And it was, very, it was very embarrassing for me because I was taller than everyone in my class, the girls and the boys. I was very zoftic, which was very unusual for a girl 11 years old. And it created a lot of problems that I sort of held on to, even though ultimately a lot of people caught up with me in height and I lost weight. I still always sort of thought of myself as that lump. That's interesting. Do you still today with the books that you've written? And <sighs> no, but I think it's been a very hard it's been a very hard thing for me to overcome. I think that it built a lot of insecurities uh, in me that I still have to really fight to get through. I always have the feeling that I'm not quite good enough. People say, why do you work so hard? And I think that really basically it's because I, I, I think I probably have to continue to prove myself to people. You know, that, that's interesting that you should still feel this way, and I also read that, that you are a perfectionist, but you're also extremely bright. I mean, obviously you wouldn't be successful, as successful as you are now, even working as hard as you do. You were also a straight-A student. You were also very talented, very young. You were singing and dancing already. Mm -hmm. uh, that also didn't make you very popular growing up. So you had not only the image problems, you were overcoming a lot of things that we would think are advantages. To I you. had people problems, really. I had very serious people problems when I was young because I was um, oversized for my age and because I wanted to sing and I wanted to dance and I wanted to act. And uh, kids can be very cruel to people who, who like to do that because they think of them as being show-offs. And I suppose in a way, you know, we are. Uh, I mean, actors are show-offs to a certain extent, as are singers and dancers. Uh, it's, it's our way, perhaps, of getting approval, but it's also something that we, we have to do, that we need to do. It's something that compels us and uh, something that we find very difficult to move away from. I know I found that out myself. Ah, interesting. That also, when you talk about the approval, one of the things also in your book that I read that you said the only time that you felt that you were getting approval was when you were singing or dancing. Yeah, I think so. The, the applause kind of is a, is a wonderful... Um, bomb for insecurities. It makes you feel that uh, that people approve of you and that you're um, acceptable to people. Uh, the problem, of course, is that you become so um, enamored of that that uh, you're constantly driving to get open approval from people. And you never really sit down and deal with your own sense of who you are. So that you, you get lulled by the approval of everyone else and then one day when, for instance, I, I left show business to a certain extent, um, I ended up being divorced after 20 years, my children grew up, uh, I didn't have applause from show business. I didn't have a husband who was telling me how beautiful and sexy I was or how smart I was. I didn't have children who said what a wonderful mother I was. I mean, they, 
they kind of grew up and moved away, and I was really suddenly stuck with my own feelings about myself and discovered that really basically they had never changed from the feelings I'd had when, when I was 11. They'd just been covered up by a lot of other things. And so I had to really, at the age of 41, uh, start to grow up for the first time. Okay, you know, but when you say that they didn't change, uh, in reading your book, uh, one in particular, Polly's Principles, uh, you've written three books, but you know, I have Polly's Principles here, which, mm -hmm. is, which was my favorite, which yeah. was my book. I even bought it years yeah. ago and reread it. Uh, you talk about, you did change. I mean, you, you, you took all of the negatives. Oh, I think I have. I think I've changed it. enormously. I, th I think that there have been tremendous changes for me, both in my attitude about myself and my attitude about others. But once in a while, <clears throat> something will kind of sneak up and I will be aware that there are still certain areas that I don't really have totally solved. And I may never have them totally solved. You know, it's very difficult to live 40-some years uh, with a certain kind of attitude about yourself and change it once and for all and forever um, in a short, medium, or long time. You, you know, you get set in patterns and it's very difficult to break them. They can be broken, but you have to be reminded all the time. What have you not solved? What are the areas that bother you? I think that I still have a lot of, of, uh, of fears about um, being good enough, you know, being able to do it. Uh, I'm getting ready to, to act again, uh, and I have done very little acting over the last 10 years. And the role that I'm doing is a very, very difficult role, and I'm very, very nervous about it. The role that you're talking about, is that the role, is that recreating the role that you did in, in The Winds of War? Yes, it's Rhoda Henry. It's the okay. sequel to Winds of War. <laughs> okay, you played Rhoda Henry, mm -hmm. in, uh, who was Robert Mitchum's wife, in The Winds of War. Right. Um, now you're going to be doing a sequel to it. You've already done her. Uh, why are you nervous about doing her again? Uh, well, because Rhoda, Rhoda becomes um, a very different woman in the, in the second piece. Yeah, well, actually, she doesn't really become different. Because she remains the same, her life changes. And uh, she goes through some very, very bad and very tough times. And Rhoda is a woman who, uh, who is very much like I used to be. She's a woman who, who constantly needs to be told that she's worthwhile, or that she's beautiful, or that she has the right dress on, or that her hair is pretty. And um, all of a sudden, she starts to get older, and uh, she starts to have problems with her marriage, and um, she starts to fall apart. She can't deal with it, and she starts to drink too much, and um, her marriage is destroyed, and she it's a very, it's the, really the role of a woman who, who inadvertently destroys her own life. You know, it's interesting how you say that there was a lot about the old Rhoda Henry that was like the old Polly Bergen. Right. Uh, there was one thing you mentioned, the approval. You mentioned during your first marriage mm -hmm. um, that you got up at 4 o'clock in the morning to put your makeup on because you didn't want to be seen without your makeup. <laughs> well, not necessarily for, but certainly I got up very early. <laughs> I, uh, no, I mean, I, I, it, it never entered my mind that, that, that me without makeup would be acceptable. Now, you have to, you please tell people I was 18 years old, you know, and this was many, many years ago when women did always have their makeup on and always had their act together and, or, I mean, I, it was, I just couldn't believe that anybody would accept me without makeup on. I mean, that, that was very frightening to me. So I would get up very, 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 very early in the morning. First of all, I would go to bed with a full makeup on, always. And then I would get up very early in the morning, wash off the old, and put on the new. So that I don't think my first husband ever saw me without this makeup. Was your, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, this certainly for two or three years, I mean, he never saw me without makeup. <laughs> that was a real honest marriage. Yeah. Just uh, a question about that marriage, because you married young. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't very long. Uh, no, as well as five years. You know, for, for five yeah. years in today's thing. That's, that's a long time in today's well, environment. Okay. <laughs> but you were both starting out in your career then. No, um, he was very successful. I was starting out in my career. Uh -huh. He was already a very successful young actor who was under contract to a studio came from a very, very wealthy family, and um, everything had kind of just sort of fallen his way. So that he kind of accidentally became an actor and, and accidentally became successful and had always had anything he had ever wanted. I came from, of course, a very different family. I came from a very poor family, and I'd always had to fight, 
you know, like crazy to get anything. And uh, so we were very different people. Um, I adored him. We really were like, we grew up together. He was like my brother. I still think of him as my brother. I see him all the time in California. He's become a very, very successful director. And he's wonderful. But at that time, uh, what happened is that shortly after I married him, my career became very successful. His career started to falter. And he was not a person who had ever had to go out and try to make good. So he didn't know how to do it. But you know how to do that. But I knew how to <laughs> do it. And you did go out and make good. We're going to take a break because uh, then you married again somebody who was very successful. Mm -hmm. You became a whole different kind of person. And now you married for the third time. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about all that when we come back. Okay. We're speaking with Polly Bergen. We're in her apartment in New York. We'll be right back after these messages. So please stay right there. Hello, I'm Arlene Hurston. We're back We're with Polly Bergen in her apartment in New York, uh, talking about your successes and your life. Uh, we mentioned you've been married three times. Uh, the second time was to Freddie Fields, very, right. very successful. I mean, he was your agent at the time. Mm -hmm. It was actually during your marriage to him that you discovered another talent. I believe that's when you first became a businesswoman, by accident. Yes, I, I, <clears throat> I actually be, uh, became a businesswoman, and I probably, during that period in my life, uh, for the first time, m became recognized as an actress. Up until then, I was really primarily a singer. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, my husband, prior to the time we were married, was a man who was in charge of uh, dramatic television shows in New York. And I lived in New York, and I kept going to him and saying, you know, why can't you get me on this show and this show and this show? And he kept saying, you're not an actress, you're a singer, stop bothering me. And I could never stand him. I mean, I thought he was the most awful person in the entire world. And uh, that we ended up marrying each other is, is um, a whole other story, but we did, ultimately. And, uh, and we had a very long and very happy marriage. For 20 years? Yes, we did. But then you got divorced. Yes, we did. So it was, uh, and now you're married to somebody 11 years younger than you are. Mm -hmm. But I was also place. single for almost 11 years. Okay, what was that like? You were in your early 40s when you divorced. What was The it like? first few years of being single were really quite terrifying for me, as I think they are for most women and most men. As a matter of fact, I'm not at all sure that men don't have a tougher time being single than women do, because they lose more. They lose their hostess, their florist, their cleaner, their launderer. They're, you know, they're, they're sock finders, they're shirt ironers, they're, I mean, they lose, a l they lose an entire staff of people and servants, you know. Very true, um, very true. Women, you know, lose the breadwinner and the lover, and depending on the relationship, the doctor, the insurance man, I mean, the person who really runs, the, runs their lives for them in terms of making all the choices. Um, it's a very, very frightening uh, a situation for women, particularly women brought up in my generation, who were really taught to believe that, that you get married once and that's it and it's forever. And I remember feeling at the end of, of my marriage to my first husband, and we, yes, married when we were children, really, both of us. And uh, as we grew up, we suddenly realized that we were better sisters and brothers than we were husband and wife. And it was a mistake of youth, I think, for both of us, and we ended up being very, very good friends, but realizing it was wrong. Uh, the second marriage for me was a very, very serious marriage, and one which, which I felt had to work for both of us and wanted it to work. And I always felt that the reason why the first marriage had failed is because I was too pushy and too successful, you know? And so I decided for my second marriage that I would lean back and let him run everything. And that would be, I mean, he was the boss, and I would follow him. I mean, I, I, this whole thing I believed in, this is what I'd been taught, this was going to be right. The odd thing about it was that with him, we both became extremely successful. He helped me become very successful, and I certainly helped him become very successful. Uh, but in fact, he ran my life, and he truly did. And I wanted him to uh, for a long time. And then I think that after 17 or 18 years, when we'd done all those things that you do when you're making you know, a successful life and a, su a successful marriage, and you're doing the offices and you're decorating the home and you're bringing up the children, you're doing all that, and all of a sudden that's all gone. And what you have is you have each other. And that should be the best time, except that we didn't have anything to talk about. You know, I mean, 
we suddenly discovered that that we we could not communicate with each other. We were real good at at running things and doing things and and being the perfect partners. And we were great partners in business, you know, but we just were not so terrific um, toward the end in marriage because I started to change. I started to understand that I wanted it to be a partnership. I didn't want to be the wife that said, yes, sir, no, sir, whatever you say, sir, anymore. And that created some problems. But also in your book, uh, in talking about your marriage, because when you wrote Polly's Principles, the marriage had already broken up. It, was, it had just broken up. Mm -hmm. You talk about how you changed. You're very, very honest about the fact how you were very cold in the beginning. Oh, yes. Um, how you did not have very many friends and how you were frigid sexually. Mm -hmm. I get the feeling, I got the feeling in that book that you felt if you had changed that maybe the marriage would have worked out, that you had regrets. Well, I think that. I tried very hard to change and, and, and I think that to a very large degree I did. Uh, I think that the problem was that I really couldn't win either way because in fact, you know, the two of us had signed a contract uh, for him to be the way he was and for me to be the way I was. That's, that's, those are the people we married, you see, and then what happened of course was that um, I started to change and he started to change. And at the end of 18 years, we had both changed to an extent where we were no longer the people we had agreed to marry. <sighs> okay, but still good friends. Still good friends. And now, as I mentioned, you're married to somebody 11 years younger. Mm -hmm. uh, were there any fears about marrying somebody? Tremendous fears. Tremendous. As I said, the first three years of being single were horrendous. The next eight years of being single were wonderful. I didn't think I would ever marry again. I didn't want to marry again. I had no intention of marrying again. I uh, didn't need to marry again, was perfectly capable of running my own life and taking care of myself. Um, I met a man who, uh, who, you know, changed my mind and okay. what more can uh, I say? Okay, well, I want you to say more. We're going to take a break. Okay. And then I, when we come back from this commercial break, I want to know why you changed your mind. Okay. We're speaking with Polly Bergen. We're in her apartment in New York. We'll be right back after these messages. Please stay right there. I'm Arlene Herson. We're back with my very special guest, Polly Bergen, here in her apartment in New York. Well, we left a cliffhanger before that commercial break. <laughs> you know, why, after 11 years of being single, did you decide to get married again? Well, I think, honestly, that Jeff was the first true partner I had ever met. Someone who was willing to share um, on every level, intellectually, um, romantically. Someone who respected me as much as I respected him who believed that I was capable of doing a lot of things, who was interested in working with me uh, and in my working with him, and who really basically is very, a very, very secure man. Very, very strong, very secure, very successful in his own right. Um, and because of that, I, I never posed any kind of threat to him. But 11 years younger, I mean... Yes, and in fact, he treats me like a fragile three-year-old, and I look at him and I think this man has got to secretly be 70. He's lying about his age, only because he's a very settled man, you know. I think that age is really up here, you know, and, and I feel much, much younger than I am. It's not a matter of wanting to look younger or be younger or pretend I'm not my age. It's a matter of just feeling very young. My husband is a very settled man who sowed all of his wild oats, and when he got married, that was forever. And he's a very solid kind of guy, whom you usually don't find except in much older men. Yes, true. Okay, this is, it all seems to be working out so well. You were also in business together. I mean, you yes. have your own business, yes. uh, which is uh, designing shoes mm -hmm. and jewelry. Right. Now, I must say, because we must know, I am wearing Polly Bergen shoes. I know you are, and so am I. <laughs> and so are I mean, you. We're both wearing okay. Polly Bergen shoes. I am also wearing Polly Bergen earrings. So, and I'm wearing Polly Bergen so earrings and, and my new silver handkerchief. <gasps> okay. Your husband is also in, a, um, in, in the shoe business, I understand. Is yes, well, he watching? really is, he is my financial advisor. And he's the man who takes care of all the business. And I take care of the design and the marketing, the selling and promoting. Uh, and it's a, it's a perfect combination because I really don't want to worry about the, the business end of it. And he's very tight. And I, I love that because... Uh, a new company has to be run very tightly in order to to grow properly. And I would spend way too much money. 
Okay, well, you certainly designed shoes beautifully, but one of the things, and you have beautiful legs, <laughs> I had to say, I don't know if we can see, but in your book, you said that uh, you were super critical of your legs because you thought they were stumpy, and I kind of wonder, now designing shoes, did you design them with your legs in mind? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, but even then, my own concept of that has changed. You know, first of all, I, I really hate the fact that I think most women are led down the garden path in terms of purchases of anything, but particularly shoes. For some reason, they seem to think that the more money they spend, the better shoe they get, and in fact, that's not necessarily true at all. And a plain pump that sells for $250 is probably not more than a dollar's worth better than a pump that sells for $70. It's just the name you're buying. So I really wanted to make very fine, attractive-looking shoes that were very feminine and very beautiful at a price that was sensible. And I think that that's what I've done. And my legs have gotten better as I've gotten older. <laughs> they haven't gotten longer. Right. They're still short, but they've gotten better. Oh, okay, well, let me tell you, they're also comfortable. This is not going to be a commercial. Good, they're supposed but to good. be. They're also very comfortable. I kind of feel with all the things that you've done. In your book, uh, Polly's Principles, the very last page said, um, you know, with all that you've done and that you felt much better about yourself and the things you've done, it said, but one day I'm going to love myself. You didn't then, and this was about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Do you love yourself today? Probably not completely. I think more, um, much more than I did then. And I think most of the time I'm pretty happy with myself. But I still have some times that I have to climb over. But that's what life is all about, is climbing over obstacles and going on to the, to the next. And what is the next? Is there... I don't know. Something. I had not any idea if I knew it would be boring. It's much more <laughs> exciting not knowing. Okay, you may not love yourself, but you did say in another article that I read that you thought you were a terrifically nice person. I think I am. I think I'm a very caring person. I think that I'm a person you can always turn to if you, if you need someone. I think I'm always there for people. And um, I think I'm basically, uh, my husband says I'm a pushover. I think I'm basically a very kind person. I, I care about other people, I guess, because I'm so conscious of, of my own problems with people when I was young and my inability to communicate. And uh, consequently, I'm very conscious of other people and not wanting to hurt them and wanting to try to make life better for them. Well, I have to say that you certainly have impressed me. <laughs> and, thank uh, you. and I thank you very much for being on, on my show and sharing your life with us. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that you have enjoyed it.